Salute, welcome to this video lesson on gerunds, gerundives, and supines. So we'll start with um, gerunds. So gerunds are verbal nouns. Gerundives are verbal adjectives. So the first thing to know about gerunds, again, are that they're nouns. Now, when I say verbal nouns, I mean they are nouns made from verbs. So for example, you can take the verb amo amare, which means to love, and then you make a noun out of it that you can use in different case forms, right? So the gerund has only four case forms. The genitive, which ends in nd long i, the dative, which ends in nd long o, and then the accusative ending in nd um, and the ablative, which just like the dative ends in d o. Now, you might be able to tell from this that this is actually declining second declension neuter. So the gerund is a second declension neuter verbal noun. Now, this is an example of a first conjugation verb, amo amare, also known as an a theme vowel uh, conjugation. But you could also have like habendi, habendo, habendum, habendo. That would be a second conjugation from habeo, habere. From mito, mitere, you would have metendi, metendo, metendum, and then metendo again with an e-n-d-o. Um, and in the third i-o, or in the fourth, you have i-e before the n-d. So for example, you might have copyendi, copyendo, copyendum, copyendo, or audiendi, audiendo, audiendum, audiendo. All right, so let's look at the translation of this. Now note in um, my notes here for the nominative, there is no nominative case of a gerund. If you need uh, something to be a verbal noun as the subject, like if you wanna say uh, loving is good, Okay, so loving would be a gerund in English, but in Latin you can't use a gerund as the subject, as a nominative. In Latin you have to use the infinitive, so you have to say literally to love is good in Latin. So you use the infinitive. Now in the genitive case, um, this would be of verbing, and in the dative it's for verbing, and in the accusative, we're not going to usually have it as a direct object. We're going to have it with a preposition like odd or in. And then in the ablative, it'll be um, by loving. So in the accusative, again, as I've shown you there, you've got a couple different options. You could say something like for loving, or you could say something like in order to love or just to love as a purpose infinitive in English. Now, you cannot um, use an infinitive in Latin to show purpose. So if you want to say why you're doing a thing, you can do that with ad amandum here, but you could never say to love and, and translate it as amare. You wouldn't want to use the infinitive in Latin if you're showing the purpose of why you're doing a thing. So um, of these different options, let's see. I mentioned the accusative there is showing purpose, but the genitive there in the phrase amandi causa or amandi gratia, those are pretty close equivalents of each other. That phrase also shows purpose because you translate amandi causa or amandi gratia as for the sake of or for the purpose of loving. So essentially that's the same base meaning as odd or in amandum right? So both that genitive phrase and the accusative phrase show um, kind of purpose in a way. <laughs> um, now the amando, when would you use that? If you were saying something like useful for loving or um, something like that. So usually the dative gets used maybe with an adjective that would take a dative. Um, the genitive can also be used in other contexts. Like if I say something like uh, cupidus habendi, desirous of having, and that would be a way of translating greedy in Latin. Uh, cupidus habendi would be desirous of having, literally, but you can see how that might indicate greedy. Uh, and then the ablative case really explains the means by which you get something done. So you could say he won a race, corindo, by running, um, something like that. Okay, let us move on to gerundives next. The gerundive is also known as the future passive participle. 
So as I mentioned a minute ago, um, gerunds are verbal nouns, gerundives are verbal adjectives. One thing to keep these, you'll notice the ND in both the word gerund and in gerundive. Um, that's not coincidental. Both of these will have the ND in the stem. We saw the ND in amandi and amando and so on up above. But here in the gerundives, you'll also see the ND. But notice that gerundive has the IV ending, just like an adjective in English. So hopefully that will help you distinguish which is which. Gerundive is an adjective, right? So the base literal meaning in all of the cases for a gerundive is to be verbed. So let's say you have the phrase Puella Amanda, that means the girl to be loved, which essentially means the girl that you really should love, okay? So it shows a kind of necessity or obligation that something be done. Now, gerundives are commonly used in the same sort of places as the gerund, uh, and they're often translated uh, with the ing, just like the gerund, even though, as I just said, literally they mean to be verbed. So, for example, in the genitive example here, amandorum hominum causa or amandorum hominum gratia, this literally means something like for the sake of people to be loved. But that makes virtually no sense in English. So what you want to translate it as is just pretend like the amandorum were actually a gerund and that hominum were actually homines, direct object and you'll end up with something that makes more sense in English and you'll say for the sake of or for the purpose of loving people. Okay, so again, literally amandorum there means to be loved, but we don't want to translate it that way. We want to translate it just like we did for the gerunds, for the sake of loving people. Okay, and then the dative, similarly, amandis hominibus, we want to translate it as if it were amando homines, for loving people. And then the accusative, again, um, here's the thing. We don't usually have a gerund or an accusative as a direct object. We'll usually have them, a gerund or a gerundive accusative as a direct object. We'll, we'll usually have them in these phrases with odd or in, or perhaps another preposition. There are a couple exceptions, um, sometimes with foc or efike, uh, which mean to make, or see to it that something's the case, or cura, take care that something's the case. Those verbs occasionally will have a gerund or gerundive uh, for the direct object, so take care that something be done. Okay, getting back to our translations here, though. So let's look specifically at ad amandos homines. Um, oh, we got a little typo there. That should have homines with a long es. Um, so for loving people or to love people. Now, I will note here, if we wanted to change this phrase to a gerund phrase, we could keep the homines as it is, except, of course, like I said, you would need the long mark on the E, um, but then we would just change amandos to the accusative gerund ending, which is amadum, and that would translate the same way, for loving people. That's because, again, literally what the gerundive is saying is for people to be loved. But that sounds ridiculous in English. It won't make any sense to anybody. So you need to change it around and say for loving people. All right, then the ablative amandis hominibus, you want to translate that just as if it were amando, gerund, homines, accusative, and so it means by loving people. So by loving people, you make lots of friends, something like that. An ablative phrase with one of these typically tells how you, how you accomplish something. Okay, gerundives in pa future passive periphrastic. So I talked about that the gerundive literally is to be verbed, and then we immediately went to translating it in different ways. That's because all of those are translated like the gerund. Now we get to a future passive periphrastic construction where you do need to translate it closer to literal. Okay, so when you put a gerundive with a form of the being verb, so sum esse fui futurus, this verb that means to be, um, it, it's going to have a different translation. So notice amandus est would mean he has to be loved or he must be loved. 
which essentially is showing necessity or obligation, just like I mentioned above. Now, amandi sunt, they have to be loved or they must be loved. Amanda erat, notice I changed the gender on the ending and I changed the verb tense of erat, um, so now it's past. And so now we say she had to be loved. Now, amandi errant, they, and notice that they is a, a feminine plural, they had to be loved. Okay, then on the next one, notice amandum is switched to a neuter singular ending, and erit is switched to future, so it will have to be loved. And then amanda errant, that is a neuter plural with the future, they will have to be loved. So if I wanted to translate these literally, here's what a literal translation of each of those in, in line is going to be. Amandus est would literally mean he is to be loved. Amandi sunt would literally be they are to be loved. Amanda erat would be she was to be loved. Amandai erant would be they were to be loved. Amandum erit would be it will be to be loved. And Amanda Erunt would be, they will be to be loved. Now, if you can wrap your hand around that, it's actually okay to translate it that way. That's the most literal way. But the way I've explained to do it here in my examples usually is easier for people to understand. So Amandus est literally, he is to be loved. But what does that mean? It means he has to be loved. Because if, if he is to be loved, it means it's sort of an expected thing, and thus has to be, must be. Okay, if you want to say who has to do the thing in one of these passive periphrastics, you know, he has to be loved by me, right? The person that has to do the thing is then going to go into the dative, which is a little bit weird because usually we're used to using a or ob plus the ablative case, which we call the ablative of agent. But instead, with a passive periphrastic, you have to use the dative of agent. So notice my examples here. Amanda mihi erat. Um, she had to be loved by me. The mihi is literally, of course, dative, and so we would expect it to be for me. Well, if you think of it sort of like this, she was for me to be loved. If you can wrap your head around that, you can see what's going on there. As far as I'm concerned, she was to be loved, right? So the, the dative there is really setting up to whom this applies. She was, for me, uh, to be loved, meaning she had to be loved by me. And then looking at the second example, Amanda Patri Erunt. Um, they will be, have to be loved by father. Or you could say, um, to do it very literally, they will be for the father to be loved, right? That's a very literal translation. This one, I think, probably even more than the other, though, uh, benefits greatly from having the translation that I give. They will have to be loved by father. Okay, down to our last type of um, verbals here. Supines. Okay, the supine is made for, from the fourth principal part. The gerunds and gerundives... Um, which we talked about up above, those are made essentially by you take the present stem, what comes from the second principal part. You do have some funny things go on where I said, you know, you get amandi for the gerund of uh, amare, then you get habindi for second conjugation, uh, and I said third also has the indi, so mitindi, but then I said third o and fourth, you have to have the ie, so you get copyindi or audiindi. Same thing happens in gerundive. So you'd have amandus, habendus, metendus, uh, copiendus, audiendus. Now when we get to supines, we're going to go to a completely different principal part, though. We're no longer dealing with those first two principal parts. We're going to go to the last principal part, the fourth principal part, and we're going to turn it into essentially a fourth declension masculine verbal noun. Now, in fact, you can make a verbal noun out of the fourth principal part of any Latin verb, um, a fourth declension verbal noun, and a lot of times they're used in other cases. But in two cases, they're known as the supine. In the accusative case 
and in the ablative case. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Again, there are other cases of these fourth declension masculine verbal nouns, and these are always made from the fourth principal part. But these are the only two that are known as the supine. Um, note, as it says, these forms are translated into English with an infinitive to verb. Okay? So the accusative supine is typically used with a verb of motion. For example, puellam auditum misi. Misi, I sent. Puellam, the girl, auditum, to hear, to listen. All right, and then urbem coptum caesar venit. Caesar is coming to capture the city. So auditum to listen, supine, coptum to capture, supine. Now you'll notice that the UM ending is not changing here. As I mentioned above, it's a fourth declension masculine verbal noun. So we're not going to change genders or anything. It's always going to be UM in the accusative. It's really easy to use, and notice this explains why you're doing something. It tells you the purpose, why you did something. But again, it's typically used when you have a verb of motion. So you send somebody else to do a thing, or you come, or go, or arrive, or whatever to do a thing, right? So this is the typical place you see it. You might see them somewhere else, but probably 95% of the time it's going to be in this context. Now, the ablative case of the supine is typically used as an ablative of respect, which is also called an ablative of specification, after certain kinds of adjectives. Um, so, for example, facile es dictu, difficile factu. It is easy to say, difficult to do. So, facile dictu, the dictu is the to say, difficile factu, factu is the to do. And then one more example, mirabile auditu, wonderful to hear. So again, adjectives like this, faculus, difficulus, easy, uh, difficult, mirabilis, wonderful. Adjectives like that, that you want to specify how this applies. Easy in what way? Easy to sing? Okay, facile cantu. Or hard to run, maybe it's a difficult course, you would say difficile cursu. So you're going to use the fourth principal part, and you're going to use this ablative ending on that, like it's a fourth declension verbal noun, uh, masculine verbal noun there. Okay, well, I hope that made sense. I hope that you learned a few things in this uh, video lesson on gerunds, gerundives, and super.